Hello again, Gary Stearman. It's time for another edition of Prophecy in the News, and you'll want to stay tuned. Today's guests, L.A. Marzulli and Russ Dizdar, are going to bring some information you need to hear. Well, it's a pleasure today to be seated in the Prophecy in the News studio with L.A. Marzulli and Russ Dizdar. Of course, our audience has met L.A. many times. Russ, it's a pleasure to meet you. I have heard you speak, and uh, you've got a lot to say. Welcome to Oklahoma City and to Prophecy in the News. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, today we're going to discuss a topic that you will hear noised about hither, thither, and yon in the Christian world today. We're going to be talking about one particular aspect of Bible prophecy. And, L.A., I would say that it's fair to mention what we're going to talk about today in the context of its having been, in many cases, mi misrepresented. We're going to talk about a word that we're hearing more and more often, and that word is Nephilim, Nephilim, Nephilim. We hear it pronounced a number of different ways. I don't know how you pronounce it, but let's talk about Bible prophecy in the context of Genesis chapter 6. Well, w w when we read Genesis chapter 6, we, we read a, a very bizarre passage, and it's been interpreted a lot of different ways. The way I interpret it, and I think the three of us would agree, is that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and we need to stop right there and define who are the sons of God. B'nai Ha Elohim, and the sons of God are the angels. Now, it doesn't differentiate between the good guys or the bad guys. Nonetheless, it, they are angels. And this, is, of course, is, whoa, how can this possibly happen? But the angels descend in the days of Jared, and they look at the daughters of men, and they, there is a union. They take wives. There is a union there, and from that union, which, by the way, is an abominable abomination and is an unholy union to the Most High God, the offspring are the Nephilim. And of course, that's when everything changes. This is not a weekend excursion. This went on for four or five hundred years and, of course, results in the flood. Now, it's been the conventional wisdom in the church at large, the institutional church for the last two, three hundred years at least, has more or less looked at these sons of God mentioned in Genesis 6 as human beings. This is a very comfortable way to look mm -hmm, at sure. it because you don't have to stretch your mind. It, it, it fits the ordinary world view. And so it's been comfortable to say the sons of God were descendants of uh, various Bible characters. But it's important to understand the context and the meaning for this reason. We live in the days of Noah right now. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the, coming of the, the days of the coming of the Son of Man. We're there, and we need to understand this. And for that reason, let's press ahead. Well, <laughs> why would Jesus, out of every place he could warn us in Scripture, he picks that one Scripture. He says, as in the days of Noah. So he's pointing back to the days of Noah. Out of the entire Tanakh, he points, to, something happens in the days of Noah, which differentiates it from any other time in history. And in my opinion, it is the presence of the fallen angels, the B'nai Ha Elohim, coming down, having union, sexual union with the women of earth, and creating this hybrid known as the Nephilim. And it's, it's otherwise, we're, we're looking at a God who is like, well, I just don't like what these people are doing, I'm going to wipe them all out. And everywhere, every time in Scripture where we see the presence of a Nephilim, the judgment is always the same. There's never any grace and mercy. The judgment is the same. The Nephilim are condemned and they are destroyed. Not only then in Genesis 6, but also afterwards. And of course, we're speaking about when the spies go into the promised land. The Nephilim are there. Now, L.A., and let me just address uh, Russ as well. Uh, you two put on a conference recently in Ohio. Yes, we did. And you talked about the, uh, the serpent mounds as they are. One in particular is called Serpent Mound, mm -hmm. but that's not the only thing that's there. And you, I think you developed uh, some very groundbreaking ideas uh, relative to the interpretation of these things. Uh, Russ, a lot of people say, well, those are the old Indian mounds that were made by American Indians, and they sort of took primitive shovels and they shoveled a little dirt up and made a, a serpent and so forth and so on. You've got a different idea. 
Yeah, because they're much older than that. And we talked to the archaeologist in the museum down there, and she even said that this is uh, the one artifact they found. This was not done by the Native Americans, and that they don't claim it was done by them. They found it later on as they arrived here, as they came. So it's been there much longer. It's uh, extremely historic, and uh, it, it points back to the giants, to the Nephilim, uh, more than anything else. And again, uh, there are geographic uh, uh, points of interest that are laid out with such amazing precision. Mm -hmm. In fact, you spoke of a road. What's that road called? Well, it's, it's called the Hopewell Road, which of course is a misnomer. Hopewell was the farmer who yeah. began to find the, the mounds. And so they have, archaeologists will admit they have no idea who these people really were or what they call themselves, but they've assigned Hopewell's name to it. This road extends from Newark, Ohio to Chillicothe. It's about 50 mile road. And again, it speaks of a technology and a civilization which somehow would have had to have the means and resources to have a workforce to enable them to build a road like this. And this is just not, this is built up. It's like about two feet high and it's very wide. And it begs the question, why? Why would they construct this? Why and how, where did the resources come to build such a road like this? Now, let's... Let's uh, try to get clear what we're talking about here. We're talking about the gradual discovery in our own day mm -hmm. of artifacts that suggest the biblical narrative reaches right out to our own time. And I'm going to read uh, parts of this again. Uh, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Now, these few little sentences contain a vast amount of information. For, for example, these B'nai Elohim saw the daughters of men that they were fair. In other words, they lusted after them. Uh, you contend these are angels. A lot of people say, well, wait a minute. Angels uh, cannot marry human women, can they? And your answer would be? Well, <laughs> nowhere in Scripture does it say that. There's no limitations here. In fact, we, when we see angels interact, one of my favorites is the three angels that come up against Abraham. They sit down, they're enjoying a meal together. Um, they're eating food. It's not illusionary. It's not some sort of delusion. Uh, Abraham and the crew are not under some sort of hypnotic spell. These angels appear as men, and they are eating food. So uh, there's no prohibition that angels are sexless. We, we don't see that anywhere in Scripture. They can, <clears throat> in some way, manifest a physical form. Yes. And, in fact, this is something they deeply desire to do as we read through Scripture. Uh, the fallen angels really wanted to take control of this earth, and there's no reason to believe that that's changed right down to the present day, right? Agreed. In, in, in fallen angels in the demonic realm, they, they, they're after the sexual component. That's, that's part of what they do in rituals, uh, we find. That's part of it. Um, so when I go back looking at the fallen angels and, and they're engaging women, yes, they're spirit beings, but we have uh, Christians need to understand that it was the Spirit of God that caused the conception in the womb of Mary. From God the Holy Spirit to human female egg, the cause of conception occurred. That's the incarnation, that's holy, that's perfect, that's God now in human flesh, whereas this is fallen angel mating with human women creating mutation, a transmutated, not even human beings. These are beyond, Nephilim, giants, mutants, uh, augmented, a lot of things, but um, their presence on the earth prior to the flood, and now in the historical studies show it's global, it's worldwide. We're seeing more and more now the evidence of that. And that speaks again to the worldwide flood issue and why God needed to do that. Now the word uh, Nephilim, uh, and we've said this many times on this program over the years, comes from a Hebrew nafal, which means to fall. And if you say Nephilim and put the I-M ending on it, it just it's the plural. It means the plural of the fallen ones. And that's translated in the, uh, in the King James Bible as giants. And giants uh, occupy a huge, huge part of Old Testament narrative. Uh, a lot of people tend to mythologize giants, but you see giants 
as basically wanting to take control of God's creation. And they almost succeeded before the flood, right? Yeah, we, we know from the apocryphal book, the book of Enoch, let's say, that these giants uh, became cannibalistic towards the end, right before the flood. They started to eat and drink uh, the flesh and blood of human beings. It got extremely nasty before the flood came and wiped them all out. Um, we also know that they were huge. And, and depending on who you talk to, you can get everything from 20 feet to 35 feet. A 35-foot giant is really beyond comprehension. And, and of course, Russ talks about this, that the Nephilim are in a fixed state. They're not interested in redemption. They're not interested in, in changing their behavior. They're in, they're in some sort of a fixed state, a fallen state. And this is why there is no redemption. What I find interesting, too, is that Jesus' passage when he says th in, in Matthew 24, they were given in marriage. Well, who is the they? Right. And that's really the whole nuts and bolts of the case. You got to go back to Genesis 6 and see that the they are the fallen ones. They were given. Mm -hmm. And he says, it'll be just like that when I return. It's huge. Now, no what else intended. is huge, in my opinion, is that there's been a cover-up of all this for a number of years. That is to say, there's a model that people have been led to believe, and the model is uh, there used to be very primitive cavemen, you know, they carried, cavemen carried wooden clubs, you know, and dragged their wives home by the hair and so forth. That was the caveman. And he evolved up to our present state. Mm -hmm. right. The Bible doesn't uh, contain that imagery at all. In fact, the Bible speaks of man having been created in the image of God right at the, at the first, sure. right at the beginning. Right. And then this other group of people coming in to try to take charge through subterfuge and through power, politics, and whatever. And this is the huge, huge story that runs all the way through the Bible. And there's been a cover-up. Uh, wouldn't you say? I would say so, because Genesis 6, I mean, you've got the flood, a worldwide flood, a judgment from God. Is it just on the base, I mean, the evil of mankind? That's a, you know, that's a big issue. But this is broader. This is the mutation of humanity. This is the picture that we have of uh, the dark side's presence, fallen angels, uh, mutating humanity. And if it went on for hundreds of years... We're talking about broad development civilization. Now the archaeological studies around the world, the ziggurats we see all around the world, the pyramids, all these places combine, and we're finding this more and more, combine Nephilim presence, human sacrifice, and a massive embedding of uh, the dark side's work in opposition to God. And I, I, the, the flood was a needed issue. It was a salvation issue uh, to, to save and preserve humanity. In fact, the battle was for hu the human genome, yes. as, as the way I read Genesis 6. The fallen ones uh, were a, not really humans. They were part human, part who knows what, uh, part uh, fallen angel, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. And the way things were progressing before the flood, the Bible seems to suggest that had not God stopped them, they would have corrupted all of humanity and the entire creation would have would have been uh, ineligible for redemption. It would have been had to be scrapped because all the all of the normal humans, the descendants of Adam and Eve, would have been uh, either killed or corrupted. And but Noah was perfect in his generations, and the, and that's the heart of the story, right? Absolutely. And and there's something deeper that goes here that the enemy. It, it's I call it the cosmic chess match. But the the fallen one. <clears throat> knowing that if he pollutes the entire genome, Messiah will never be born. And so it comes down literally to eight people. And I strongly believe that those eight people were pure in their generations. I don't believe that God missed one someplace. Or like, you know, Ham's wife was, had Nephilim blood. I don't, I don't believe that. Otherwise, let me see, let me get this straight. God wipes everyone out and he misses this one over here. That just doesn't, that just doesn't hold water for me. But the, 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 the crux of it is, Unless, unless those eight people were pure, the bloodline of the Messiah, Messiah can't be born. There's no redemption for the human race. And I mean, it's be, hardball. And that might be the reason for the, the historical genealogy of Jesus given in the Gospels. Sure. Where we have Jesus tracked all the way back to Adam, it's all pure human ancestry. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if it's there as a definitive issue. He's come uh, to share in, in humanity for that redemption. Uh, without any corruption along the way. Uh, the opposite or the, uh, that which contrasts that is the Nephilim issue, all the way through the Old Testament. 
Now, why is it necessary to know all this? I'm sure that there are a lot of Christians who are saying, perhaps, I'm content with what I know about the Bible, the way it's, uh, we worship the Lord in our church, uh, we go to Sunday school, and so forth. This is far out stuff. Why, why do we need to move into this realm? It, is this in truly instructive? That's the question. Well, <laughs> it's, it, unless we come to grips and understand who the Nephilim were, and understand Jesus' own admonition and warning to us, that it will be like the days of Noah when I return. You can't make it any clearer than that. And so, again, we look at the differentiation, which we talked about, the days of Noah. The fallen ones are back. There's a breeding program going on. There's genetic manipulation that's happening. This is chilling. And I believe that the same exact thing is happening as we speak. There's genetic manipulation going on. That, that We don't see them now. The Nephilim aren't roaming the earth. But I believe the fallen one is up to his old tricks again, and I also believe that perhaps this mark of the beast, and we've talked about this before, this may be some sort of an implant which changes the very DNA structure and you lose your humanity and you become the seed of the serpent. Well, let's camp on that for a moment because that's a, an excellent idea. <clears throat> what would be wrong with taking the mark of the beast? The Bible seems to suggest it is a fatal, irreversible move. You take the mark, that's it. Well, instant what, judgment. Yeah, instant judgment. Why would that be? Couldn't I just remove the mark, scratch it out? If it's a, if it's an implant, take it out and throw it away and say I'm no longer under the mark of the beast. Or you're suggesting that the mark of the beast is is a bigger change, something that couldn't be reversed. Absolutely. I think and whoever takes the mark. And why is the judgment there? You take the mark, you wind up in a lake of fire. The Nephilim wiped out on the flood. Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. Yeah. Why? Because when the, when the two angels show up, the men want to have sex with them. Why do they want to have sex with the angels? What about when we see, and also afterwards, in Numbers 13, 33, when the spies go in to the promised land, who were there? The Nephilim tribes were there. And, that's, now, and the judgment for them is always the same. When the Nephilim are concerned, they wipe them out. This is more or less uh, the topic uh, of this conference that, that you and Russ put on recently. And by the way, I'm, I'm holding here a package of five DVDs, and we'll offer this uh, in a moment. But this five DVD package is, is titled Giants Hiding in Plain Sight. Christians need to know what's being hidden. I believe this. I know you fervently believe it. And you've got some research that's going to be coming out in a while that's going to just blow the lid off everything. And, and Russ, you too have a heart to reveal this to people spiritual people today. Sure. They need to understand. Gary, we're, we're, the church is too far behind on a lot of subjects. The world's discussing this issue. The world's discussing the issue, mm -hmm. the world of occultism, New Age, spiritual, spirituality. Um, Aleister Crowley was interested in the hybrid demon-human mix. Al Aleister Crowley was a man who called himself the beast, the beast by the way. Extreme. And if you're a beast, you're not a human being, you're an animal. That's yeah. right. He sort of wanted to be a beast. Right, and he was in some of the darkest of human uh, you know, rituals and blood rituals, as was Jack Parsons, an American rocket scientist. He JPL. Did the, yeah, and he did the Babylon working in the Mojave Desert in which he attempted to create a hybrid. They, there was a desire to redo this along with Himmler and Hitler, the master race is all about, there's a desire, there's a concept about trying to recreate the Nephilim. As a matter of fact, famous story about Hitler was that he had a vision of this beast, what he called the new man, yeah. right. who the appeared Superman, to right. him in a vision, and the new man more or less promised him that Hitler, Hitler in the Thousand Year Reich would be comprised of a new form of man, higher than human, called the Aryans. Mm -hmm. And so he had this very same vision, the, the, the image of the improved in, human being. In, in, in historically, this is history now, they created Lebensborn, birthing centers in which they began to create this. 400 to 900,000 between 1939 and 1941, where they were developing, they were practicing this. They were really after it, and uh, they desired that. And that's part of the occult world right now. As believers, we should be at the cutting edge. We should be out there with scripture that already talks about this, speaking the truth about it. L.A., there are ruins all over this earth. In, in Eastern Europe, there's a giant pyramid bigger than the one in Egypt. In Egypt, that, that pyramid was not built by the Egyptians. Come on. Yeah. It, no human being could have built it because it's far too complex. There are pyramids, and one recently discovered off the coast of China, under the ocean. 
they were everywhere. Who were these pyramid people and why pyramids? What were they after? Well, that's uh, a subject perhaps for a latter time. Basically, there was a grid um, that was here, and, and other, other authors have discovered this. There was an ancient grid which covered the planet. Well, my question really goes to this. There was a system of control yes. by a, a group of people who couldn't be called humans. They were hybrids of some sort. Uh, and the Bible refers to them as giants, Nephilim. Uh, we see them in the Old Testament as under a number of names. They're the Amims and mm -hmm. the Zuzims and the Zamzumims and, right. and on and on and on. All different kinds of giants. These people were not pure human. They were hybrids. And why is it important to track this piece of knowledge? Well, one of the reasons why we went to Newark is because in those burial mounds, uh, primitive archaeological digs were done. And, and what's amazing is that some of these skeletons were between seven foot, which isn't that tall, but some of the larger ones were nine and a half, almost ten feet. And now we're looking at double rows of teeth and six fingers. And we're looking at 27 and a half pound axe heads and, and other artifacts found with these, um, with these giant skeletons. Okay. And so the theory is basically that not all the Nephilim were killed when Joshua and Caleb came in. And it fits the timeline of 3,500 years ago because we see in Newark, Ohio, these, these, this, these mounds that were built and they are dated to about 3,000 to 3,500 years ago. Right. So it fits the timeline of the conquest of the Levant, the conquest of Canaan. And the Newark Circle Mound, the, you know, this place where the giants and, and were, were um, is connected with the Mayan Temple. <clears throat> Chechen Itza. A matter of fact, modern day Mayans have come to the Circle Mound to do ritual in the center there because they know it's connected to them. So you've got the ziggurat at, at uh, Chechen Itza, you've got Quetzalcoatl, um, which may have been Nephilim, and mass human sacrifice. Wherever you find Nephilim, you find mass human sacrifice and the development of architecture that seems to embed as if they were embedding a civilization. You know, it strikes me, and this may be totally off the subject, but we'll get back quickly, but, but <clears throat> remember the story of Jack and the beanstalk and the sure. giant? Sure, And the giant, what does the giant say? fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman. He wanted blood. Mm -hmm. You know, he smelled blood. He wanted blood. This is not at all unlike the sacrificial systems that we encounter all over the ancient world. There was a thirst for blood among these fallen angels and their offspring that comes down to us through a number of different historical channels. Well, in, in Newark, Ohio, when we were in the Circle Mound, and Fritz Zimmerman was there with us, and, and there was an altar that was discovered, an archaeological did, and the remains of human beings were on that altar. Mm -hmm. There's another high place. It's called the, um, the I think, the, the Lizard Mound, but it's, I, I think it's the wrong name, but it's above Newark, and it looks down the entire valley. Again, when they did archaeological digs there, they found an altar with human remains. So we see human sacrifice being done. And this, to me, links back to the fallen ones, the fallen angels. And you, you have told me that, that these artifacts, so these ancient uh, uh, monuments, if you will, are not crude at all. They, they really display a lot of reasoning power, a lot of ability to construct something complex. Mm -hmm. Well, just look, look at the Circle Mound in, in, in North Ohio, you know, 1,250 feet. Um, and again, the, this mound is huge. When you stand in it, you're dwarfed. And it's best seen because the, the Circle Mound leads to the Octagon Mound. It was at one time one, one large complex. Yeah. And when you're down in it, like we were, okay, you see a circle. When you're above it in the air, mm -hmm. you see the whole complex. Mm -hmm. Who is the prince of the power of the air? Kind of sounds like uh, some of the other uh, artifacts in, in South America, the plains of Nazca, where sure. certain things that were constructed on the ground can only be viewed from the air, and who would be watching from the air? You know, interesting. You know, there is so much that we, we've just scratched the surface today, and I have a five-disc uh, DVD set here uh, entitled Giants Hiding in Plain Sight. And it, uh, it, it's a, basically a recording of the conference put on by L.A. and Russ 
uh, that we've been talking about. Five DVDs, and this would be about seven hours. In fact, I have watched this, believe me, gentlemen. I, I, I really have watched all the DVDs. As I was working at my desk, I let this run on the side so that I could kind of absorb it, and it's, it's well done, and there's a lot of information in it. And uh, these five DVDs are yours for $49.95. You just uh, uh, call the 800 number on your screen right now, and uh, somebody will help you. And they will, if you ask for the Nephilim Mounds package, they will also include absolutely free two extra DVDs. This one's L.A. Marzulli. It's called The Cosmic Chess Match, and which, by the way, is the name of uh, one of your books. And uh, the other one is Doug Hamp speaking on the rise of the Nephilim. You've seen Doug Hamp here on Prophecy of the News, and uh, a lot of you are familiar with his work. Again, the name of the DVD set is Giants Hiding in Plain Sight. Yours for $49.95 plus shipping and handling. You've got the 800 number on your screen right now. Give it a call. And remember to ask for the Nephilim Mounds package. That way the people who are on the phone will know what you're asking for. The Nephilim Mounds package plus those two bonus DVDs. Well, we're down to a couple minutes here, guys. What have we left out? Almost everything, right? I mean, there's so much more to talk about. Sure. Well, even the, you know, again, Christians need to be at the cutting edge. We don't need to be 30 years behind on these subjects. We, should, we have the answers in which from this then we point to Christ, a Redeemer. Uh, it, it, the New Agers, by the hundreds of millions, can talk about Nephilim, the, the alienologists and those into ufology and uh, deep occultists. They all understand this subject, but this is a biblical subject and we should know this. You know, a lot of people, and not always Christians, have written about what they've called a quote-unquote alien hybridization program that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be shocked that they say this because the Bible talks about an alien hybridization program, right? It does, and it links right back to Genesis 6, and that's why Jesus points out very clearly, as in the days of Noah, so it will be when I return. And what differentiates those days is the presence of the fallen angels having sex with the women and creating mm -hmm. a hybrid. And I believe with all my heart that we're seeing that very same thing happening today with, of course, the abduction phenomena, which happens with the UFOs. We've got to continue this discussion because we're just getting Too warmed much. up. <laughs> Russ, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. I've, I've seen you. I've, uh, I've experienced your work. Uh, and any last thoughts? We've just got a few seconds. Well, it, it involves our whole spiritual warfare aspect and understanding of God's mission. So it's just vital for us to understand and know this and then apply it as far as how do we answer the world and how do we live. If we are ignorant of what's going on, we won't know how to behave, how That's to right. pray. Well, I understand that. Russ, L.A., thanks for being here. Thank you. It's Pleasure. always good to talk to these guys. And believe me, they pray. They pray over their work. They pray for the leading of the Lord because they take very seriously what they are researching and what they are bringing to you. And when you see this DVD set, you will understand that. Gary Stearman, thanks for joining us today. And remember, he's coming soon, so keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported program made possible by our many friends around the world. Be sure you tune in every day for breaking news and our daily prophetic news updates at prophecyinthenews.com or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash prophecyinthenews.